Bama's back as SEC champion and college football playoff participant. Uh, we go to Stephen M. Smith of Touchdown Alabama to help us break it down. Join Steve's show each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday right here on YouTube. Call in show on Alabama football and the SEC in my own words. That's every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 6 p.m. Central Time. Stephen, how are we doing today? Doing great, Mark. Doing great. We're now at the point where we got this early signing period and recruiting taking place on next week, the 15th. So after you know, Alabama getting the victory over Georgia and the SEC championship and now number one in the college football playoff into this uh, venue here, saving the guys hitting that recruiting trail now. Yes, number one in the country on the field in 2021. Number one recruiting class is rated by 247 Sports heading into National Signing Day just six days away. So with 21 hard commits right now, Stephen, what work needs to be done between now and December 15th? I think trying to see, can it get all of these guys to sign here, Mark, on a dotted line? I know since the SEC title game, Coach Saban and his staff have been busy here hitting the trail, whether it's Pete Golding looking at recruits, uh, Sal Sanceri looking at some guys, uh, cornerbacks Coach Jay Belay, even Coach Saban hopping on the plane, going from place to place here, talking to some young athletes. Five-star corner Damani Jackson out of California, he's been getting some visits here. Four-star corner Earl Middle Jr. from Florida. Uh, Coach Saban has met with him. Uh, some of the assistants have met with four-star uh, defensive lineman Curtis Perry in the Alabama area. Uh, some have met with Marvin Jones Jr., who's a teammate of Earl Middle Jr. So a lot of these guys are getting visits here right now. Uh, Coach Saban trying to figure out can he can he get them can he get all of these guys to sign here on the 15th because now as you know since 2018 when you have both signing periods your early one and now your traditional one your early one now becomes the main thing so you got to get the majority 80 to 90 percent of your guys signed by the early signing period and then hope to get you know some few snaggers in the traditional period in february all right, I'm going to open it up to anyone in this class, When whether you want to highlight one, two, or three. I know it's almost impossible when I ask you this question because the, the classes are so loaded, but, but in regards to who's already committed, who really jumps out at you that you're impressed with? I mean, who jumps out at me right now is the, is uh, J Jeremiah Alexander, uh, the four-star from Thompson High School in Alabaster. This is a mean uh, defensive lineman, outside linebacker. This guy rushes mean, gets to the quarterback mean, stuffs the run mean. Uh, Coach Mark Freeman at Thompson has done a tremendous job. You got to give Coach Mark Freeman of Thompson a lot of credit. Uh, this program has won, I think, four or five, no huge 7A state championships chips in his tenure and uh, Jeremiah Alexander can rush the quarterback with a hand in the dirt can rush the quarterback standing up just a freakish athlete and uh, you know Alabama has not consistently gotten those freakish athletes from the defensive line in the last uh, few classes here they've gotten some good athletes but not the ones that remind you of the of the of the Deron Paynes, the Quinnen Williams, you know, the guys like that that just really jump off the page. And when you watch Jeremiah Alexander play, uh, that young man jumps off the page. We ask everyone to like the video and uh, share these videos out on social media because if you enjoy the content, uh, others that don't know that we're here discussing college football each and every day, they will as well. And uh, head on over to. Um, touchdownalabama.com and right here on YouTube, uh, Stephen show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 6 p.m. Central in my own words, call in show, get uh, yourself prepared for the big matchup against Cincinnati in the college football playoffs. Stephen, let's take it back to the SEC championship game because just when I think that I can't be any more amazed with Nick Saban in this program, this is what happens. I didn't count them out of this game. I'm not going to say that I picked them to win this game, but it what happened on Saturday did not surprise me once whatsoever. At the same time, they were a touchdown underdog, and there were people counting them out, and we know that they struggled against the likes of LSU and Arkansas and Texas A&M and uh, the most latest in the Iron Bowl, where they probably should have lost that game. Uh, and then they, they fix things, and they take on the consensus number one team in the country, and they win by double digits. 
Coach Saban is the mastermind of philosophy, Mark. That's, that's all I can say. He's the mastermind of philosophy. I mean, the, the entire week of practice, he challenged the offensive line. Because let's face it, we all knew coming in that in losing Landon Dickerson and losing Deontay Brown and Alex Netherwood, it was going to be a work in progress on the offensive line. However, I don't think a lot of us expected the up and down, the inconsistency throughout the season, and, and that's what we saw. And going to the matchup against Georgia, the conversation was, if Alabama is struggling with the LSUs, the Auburns, the Floridas, the Texas A&Ms, how are they going to handle 6'6", 340, Jordan Davis? How are they going to handle N'Kobe Dean? How are they going to handle Nolan Smith and, and Channing Tindall and Quay Walker and all of these guys that Kirby Smart is just breeding in Athens over there? So that, that was a concern coming in, but – the entire week of practice, Nick Saban put it on this offensive line. He also put it on Doug Marone, who's the coach of the offensive line. And, and these guys got together, got a plan in place. And then I don't know what Seth McLaughlin's parents have been working with him on, but uh, ever since the young man from Beaufort, Georgia, the three-star from the 2020 class has been inserted into this offensive line. Boy, has he galvanized his front with, with, with his play. Not, not the biggest guy at 6'4", 290, but boy, is he feisty. Is he scrappy? Does he get after it from that center position? Because he was right there on Jordan Davis all game long. So you got to give Coach Saban credit for really challenging this offensive line, but you got to give the offensive line credit for wanting to take on that challenge wanting to prove to the college football masses that they could keep Bryce Young off the ground. They could protect well. They could hold their own against Georgia's front. I said it throughout the entire week. If Alabama's offensive line could win some one-on-ones, I didn't think they would overwhelm Georgia, but if it could win some one-on-ones and give Bryce a shot, he could hit a lot of those deep plays to Jamison Williams and other guys in the receiver core. And that offensive line, boy, did it give Bryce Young some time. I knew you were going to go to the offensive line, and rightfully so, because they were the stars of that game, and it was astonishing to see them a week earlier struggle against, albeit a strong, stout Auburn front. There's no question they have a top 10 or 12 unit up front, but Georgia's just been off the charts dominating uh, up front, led, of course, by Jordan Davis, and to see that Alabama offensive line execute uh, in one week was just phenomenal. And I got to think that Bryce Young wrapped up the Heisman Trophy with that performance. Oh, oh, oh absolutely. I mean, when you look at, you know, SEC championship game record, 421 passing yards and four total touchdowns in that matchup. And just for him, uh, if you contextualize just the season Bryce has had here, Mark, you look at this, you lose a Najee Harris to the NFL. You lose a Devontae Smith and a Jalen Waddle. You lose, as I mentioned, the three offensive linemen in Dickerson, Leatherwood, Deontay Brown. You lose Steve Sarkeesian, who did a masterful job. You lose him to the head coaching job at Texas. All of the offensive pieces that you lost. And for Bryce Young to come in here, uh, he's got a 4,000-yard season. I mean, he's second to only Mac Jones for single-season passing yards for Alabama. He's tied with Tua Tonga Bangoa from 2018 for single season touchdown passes in school history with 43. I mean, the guy is in the top 10 in almost every major statistical category in terms of quarterbacks, with the exception of completion percentage. I mean, Bryce Young has had an in incredible year and in my opinion he's had to do more with less when you look at mac jones and tua they had steve sarkeesian they had a Najee harris they had a a, a jerry judy a Devontae smith a Jalen waddle you know big play weapons big play targets like that i'm not saying that john mechie is not on that level he's good he's really good and alabama got a godsend with jameson williams out of a transfer portal but the fact that all that Alabama lost offensively, and you have a Bryce Young as a first-year starter, and he's able to be that truck, as Bucky Brooks of NFL Network would always say, you have trucks and you have trailers. Bryce Young being that truck to more times than not pull this team out of some points of inconsistency and still have it win the SEC championship and still have it in the college football playoff, you got to give it up to that young man. And then on the flip side of the ball, uh, going into this game, 
uh, Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin, they have strong offensive lines, some of the best in the nation. But when you're combining talent that's going to play in the NFL and execution, that Georgia line was playing as well as anybody. And we know that they've got a stockpile of running backs back there led by Zamir White. Um, and we know Alabama, they they came in top two or three in the nation in rush defense. So that was going to be just a monumental battle up front. But Alabama certainly did more than hold its own. They they shut down pretty much the Georgia rushing attack. And then more and more as the game progressed, they got after Stetson and Bennett. I thought the communication, Mark, was at its best all year, all year long. That was the most communication for an Alabama defense I've seen to where everybody knew what to do. There were moments this season where a call would get made out on the field and guys would be confused, whether it's Josh Job not knowing what's going on, whether it's guys misaligned, uh, guys not in the right gaps. There was just so much frustration throughout the season in terms of why are we not communicating? Why are guys not lined up correctly? Why is so-and-so not in their gap? We had this happen all year. But against Georgia, something clicked where you saw – linebackers tapping defensive linemen. Hey, you in your gap? Get in there. Cornerbacks making sure you got the call. Okay, let's roll here. Linebackers talking amongst each other. There was one play in particular. I saw Christian Harris run down the line, take on a block, shut it off, and nail Zamir White in the backfield. Have not seen that from Christian Harris all year consistently until that play. And then you go back to the pick six by Jordan Battle, reading it, seeing it, jumping the route, picking it off, going back to the house with it. The communication that DeMarco Helms had out there, he was breaking up on passes. He was helping out on the back end. He created an interception there. And Helms has been playing some of his best ball since the Iron Ball. Brian Branch went out there reading his keys, playing sound on his end, and just everybody on the same key. That was the main thing. And Alabama fans have been waiting on this all year from this defense is, can we get a game where everybody is on the same key from start to finish? And you saw that. You even saw the confidence in Pete Golding in terms of his play calling, where he was not only getting pressure to Stetson Bennett, uh, Mark, and stopping the run, but the but disguising the coverages. You saw Stetson Bennett kind of feel like, okay, maybe I have this guy here, and then boom, he doesn't see where the safety is actually lurking, ball gets picked off. It was a strong play calling game from Pete Golding's in also. And certainly one of the key plays of the game, even though uh, it was difficult to contain uh, one Brock Bowers, he's one of the best tight ends of the country. He's just hit the scene and just taken off was the the play made on him. Uh, I can't remember the DB that cut him off uh, in the red zone to make that pick. That that was that, that was that was uh, that was DeMarco Helms, actually. So on that play. Uh, Brock Bowers has the ball over Daniel Wright, who's in good position. But you know, Brock Bowers is what eight feet tall. But uh, what a job there by Demarco Helms once again coming over the top, finishing that play, getting enough of that ball to knock it away from Bowers. And that young man is going to be uh, a first round pick you know, potentially. I mean, the guy is you know, ten catches for 130 yards was basically uh, the lone weapon out there that Stetson Bennett trusted getting the football too. But DeMarco Hallams, the last two weeks of the season, has really come on at that free, at that, uh, free safety spot. Stephen M. Smith, TouchdownAlabama.com. Join him and the rest of the staff right there for Alabama football coverage. And, of course, uh, his uh, show that you can catch right here on YouTube every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Lock it in, 6 p.m. Central Time. In my own words. All right, Stephen, now we got this matchup against Cincinnati. And uh, this is prime territory for Nick Saban to be telling his team, let's not listen to the rat poison because they're going to be hearing for three weeks that they're going to blow Cincinnati off the map. And um, I give all the credit in the world to the Bearcats. Uh, what they've accomplished under Luke Fickle the last few years in building that program has been phenomenal. And you only have to look back one year uh, to where they – they uh, took on this aforementioned Georgia team to the wire in, in a Peach Bowl game. So they're, they're certainly a quality team. I don't know if they're quite up to the, the, the level of Alabama to, to be competing in this playoff, but that's why we, we need to see this matchup. Uh, your thoughts about the Bearcats? One thing for certain here at Mark is that Luke Fickle is a Luke Fickle knows how to win championships. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves here. He was on two national championship Ohio State coaching staffs. 
He was on Jim Trestle's staff in 2002 as a special teams coach. So he saw that. And then he was on Urban Meyer's staff in 2014 as a co-defensive coordinator and linebackers coach. So Luke Fickle knows how to win championships. And so he comes over to Cincinnati in his fifth year, and he has done an incredible job. Desmond Ritter is a confident quarterback. That kid can throw the football. You know, 3,190 passing yards. He's got 30 touchdowns on the year. Highly athletic. He's got six rushing scores. Uh, he He's kind of built for these types of moments. You've got a Jerome Ford that since he left Alabama – in 2020 and got to Cincinnati that year, he's been a pleasant surprise for the Bearcats this season. Of Jerome Ford, a 1,000 yard back and 19 rushing touchdowns for him. Now they've got weapons at wide receiver, they got a big tight end that's a big playmaker on that side of the football. And then defensively for the Bearcats, they run this 3 3 5 stack type of defense. They got two veteran playmaking corners. They got a pass rusher in Curtis Brooks. If I'm not mistaken, that guy gets out for the quarterback. So they've got veterans here on both sides of the ball that love playing in these types of games where they got a chance to show the world the little guy can do some stuff. The little guy can do some things. And it just kind of reminds me, you know, the Boise States in years past, the BCS. I just enjoy crashing the party under Chris Peterson. Here's a moment here for Cincinnati and Luke Fickle. They're going to be up for it. They're going to be ready for it. They're going to be prepared for it. Uh, but, the, but like you mentioned, Mark, it's do they have enough? That's going to be a thing for Cincinnati. Do they have enough? Yeah, it's really an astounding story. As you mentioned, Luke Fickle was 4-8 and eight his first season in Cincinnati. He had to build this from the ground up, and now they're a national power. And, um, yeah, in terms of the, the level of NFL talent that they're going to see in the field, again, we, we just have to go back 2019. They were in Columbus against Justin Fields in Ohio state, uh, this past season, of course, we mentioned the Georgia game, uh, you know, facing one of the best rosters in college football in a peach bowl. And then this past season, having to go to Notre Dame and, and think about the pressure, they, they had no margin for air this season. And I know they scuffled against a lot of marginal teams, but they had no, no, no room for air. They had to win them all, and they went to Notre Dame and won by two scores against the top five team in the nation. So they can do it. Um, I, I don't know that they've faced this, this quite this wave of, of talent, but it's going to be uh, phenomenal to see. So, Stephen, of course, John Metch, he's going to miss the playoff game. Uh, we know that despite the tremendous wide receiver room, it's not quite, to your earlier point, at the level of, four first round picks in the same wide receiver room as we saw a couple of years ago. It's just not quite at that level. So who's going to have to step up in place of Mechie? Well, Alabama's got two guys that actually play in that X position that John Mechie was in. And those two guys being Trayshawn Holden and Ja'Cory Brooks, the sophomore and the freshman, and got a chance to speak with both Bryce Young and Jamison Williams on Tuesday. And both of these two very confident in what Brooks and Holden can do. Uh, both of these two guys do some of the similar things that John Mechie does in the field. Holden has a bit more speed at 6'3", you know, 208 pounds. But Ja'Cory Brooks... I kind of compare Ja'Cory's freshman year to Devontae Smith's freshman year at Alabama in 2017 in the sense of Brooks just knows the moments when those big plays have to be made, and he knows how to come down with those plays. It's just like 2017, uh, Jerry Judy and Henry Roggs, they came in lauded with all the praise and the expectations and the joy around them. And quite naturally, they deserved it because of their skill set. But when the moment was we got to have this badly, the ball always found its way in the hands of number six for some odd reason. It always found its way into Devontae Smith's hands. And I kind of feel the same vibe here. When you look at Ja'Cory Brooks, Alabama brought in four big receivers in this 2021 class. When you discuss Christian Leary and JoJo Earl and Ajayi Hall and Ja'Cory Brooks. And of the four, you know, Brooks didn't get a whole bunch of attention. He kind of popped in here late. But when you watch him play, the, the route running, the hands, the body control, the balance, but the ability to recognize this is a big moment and the ball's got to be in my hand. He has all of those types of traits. John Mechie even spoke on, hey, I mean, this guy, big body, big hands, big ability. Like, the way he goes about practicing, the way he goes about the craft, the way he goes about the work, like, 
Corey Brooks is something else here. So, you know, both of these two, Holden and Brooks, the team will interchange these two in place of Mechie. But I will keep my eyes number seven, Brooks. He, he, he's kind of got that rare uh, quality. Now, along with those two, of course, Slade Bolden, his responsibility is going to be uh, maximized a bit more. And, and, con and, and contrary to, you know, people's opinions of, well, Slade doesn't have the speed and Slade doesn't have the go-go boots that other guys have on this team. Slade Bolden, five catches for 54 yards in the SEC championship game. And the, the guy just knows how to burn you and finding the holes in the zone, sitting in there, you know, making the catch, converting that first down, converting that big play when you need for him to do so. I mean, aside from uh, Bolden, you got two tight ends in Jamil Billingsley and Cameron Latou. And, and more so Jamil Billingsley, I think it's time for Bill O'Brien to kind of reaffirm him and, and reestablish him as a weapon in this offense. I know early on in the, in the season, you know, Jamil had some off-field issues. He and the coaching staff butted heads a little bit, but they're fine now. The relationship with Saban's fine now. The relationship with the staff is fine now. Jamil's had some issues with a few drops here and there, but he has shown the ability to be a team player. He's been throwing some great blocks, springing Jamison Williams, John Mechie, and other guys up and down the field for big plays. So as you get into the playoff, I think it's time for the staff to reestablish, reaffirm Jamil Billings. Like, hey, man, we trust you. We know you're a big-time deal. We know you're a big weapon in this offense. We are going to get your confidence where it needs to be and going to you and getting you the football. To Stephen's point, uh, Slade Bolden, 10 yards per catch, so he's not a blow-it-off-the-top defense. Uh, Jamison Williams type, 21 yards per reception, and we see the ridiculous highlight plays from Jamison Williams each and every week. But Slade Bolden with 32 catches, and Ja'Cory Brooks only caught five. Check out the end of the uh, Iron Bowl. Uh, you will see a tremendous play in the corner of the end zone uh, by the pylon uh, in the clutch to tie that game and send it into overtime from... Uh, Bryce Young there, and they've got a whole lot of productivity to replace John Mechie with 96 catches. That's got to be a top five mark in the history of Alabama football, I got to think. That is actually number three all time in single season history with, for John Mechie. 96 catches, number three uh, all time in single season uh, annals there for uh, the Crimson Tide. And, and, and Mechie, and what people, people don't realize, Mark, is when Mechie came into the season, he was not fully 100% because he had gotten surgery to heal some injuries that he had to end the 2020 season. So he didn't play in the spring. He did not do much in the summer. And so it wasn't until the Mississippi State game this year that you kind of saw Mechie fully getting back to 100% the way he was for much of last year. And that's when you saw Mechie have the 100-yard game against Mississippi State. That's when you saw him have the 100-yard game against uh, Tennessee and I think against Arkansas as well. So it, it wasn't until the Mississippi State game this season that Mechie became back to, his, back to himself again and started to put together some really strong stack some really good performances together it does sting not having him for the playoff because he is a 1,000 yard receiver he is a you know four 100 yard game guy on the campaign but this is why coach Saban stockpiles receivers every year and the recruiting class is for moments like this right here well, folks it was a topsy-turvy season people wanted chaos they got some level of chaos and unpredictability but when it all landed Bama's number one on the field. Bama's number one in the recruiting uh, headed toward uh, 2022. Stephen M. Smith, Touchdown Alabama, right here on YouTube as well. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, in my own words, you got to catch his show at 6 Central Time. Stephen, we appreciate you stopping by, and we'll uh, catch up with you soon. Absolutely, Mark. Y'all take it easy, man.